Let's be seated, church, and go ahead and grab your Bibles. Let's turn to the book of Job as we return this morning to chapter 2, and we are entering in this study our second study from the book of Job, our second what we might call our mini-series in this book. But just in case you are new or in case you haven't really been through all of these, just take a look at your outline that's in your Bible, and you'll see very quickly that our first mini-series was a series that we titled, When Your World is Turned Upside Down. And that's what these first two chapters really present to us about this man named Job. And we just quickly want to remind ourselves so we can understand as we come to chapter 2 that even though there are these why questions in Job's heart, these unexplainable struggles and, and, and these confusions and tensions that are going on in his life, it's even in the midst of these great and incredible truths that we saw about him and we learned from his life in chapter 1. Those four things are the four theological things that we said we need to make sure we hold on when our world is turned upside down, and they are things like this. We need to know that not all suffering in our life is because we have sinned. The story of Job is set in this context to let us know that Job's suffering isn't about anything he's done wrong. So it's important to keep that. Or we'll die a thousand deaths over and over trying to figure out, what could I have done better? What did I do wrong? Maybe if I do that, things will go better. But often, as in the story of Job, it has nothing to do with what we have done. The second lesson we gleaned from this first mini-series was that we need to come to the place, as Job did, where the glory of God is more important than our own or Job's, as he would say, comfort and happiness. We really need to ultimately make that choice to say what matters most is that I put God on display in these unanswerable, unexplained times of suffering. And number three, we learned from this first series that we studied that biblical prosperity is growing richer in our knowledge and love of God. And that's exactly what Job did. When he went through those things, he had grown to that place to where he was able to say, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And he was able to say to his own wife, aren't we supposed to receive good from God as well as evil? Those, those great things and those not great things, don't we really need to come to that place? And for, for an individual to grow to that place and to see that that is the greatest riches in the world truly is a lesson that Job taught us. And then finally we learned that when we think about this context of suffering, when we haven't done anything wrong, we haven't sinned and by our sin encountered some kind of suffering, it's very important to remember who's doing what. And so we concluded with that lesson, reminding ourselves that Satan is the immediate cause of our suffering. He's the one that hates you. He is the one who is after you. He is the one who would like to kill, steal, and destroy everything in your life. That's who that is. But we don't lose sight of the fact, as Job didn't lose sight of the fact, that God is the ultimate cause behind it. Nothing could have come into Job's life your life or my life had God, not in his sovereignty, thought it was a good thing for us. Now, I know your definition of good and my definition of good looks totally different than God's. But it is a good God, a sovereign God, who in the end, though Satan immediately is the one after us, God is the one ultimately in charge. As mysterious and as unexplainable as that is, that's exactly what it is about. Now that leads us to our second mini-series that we're going to begin this morning, and that is a series that begins in chapter 2, verse 11. And it's a series I've entitled, When God is Silent. When God is Silent. That will be the recurring theme all the way from chapter 2, verse 11, through chapter 38 of the book of Job. Now, it's important for you to understand what I mean when I say God is silent. I do not mean that God has not revealed everything we need to know in his word. I'm confident that as you sit here this morning and you hold your Bible in your hand and you take it home and you read it, everything that you need is in this book. There is not one thing God has withheld from you that you absolutely need. That's what 2 Peter 1.3 reminds us of. Everything we need for life, whatever comes our way, and how to be godly in that is given to us in this book. And I am confident that everything Job needed at that moment in his suffering, even in his period of life when it's way back around Genesis chapter 12, at that point, everything he needed 
He had. He knew God was sovereign. He knew that God loved him. He knew there was a devil who hated him. And he knew that God was working out his purposes and his plan. And how much more today, you and I who sit here with 66 complete books of the Bible, revelation from God, spoken to us, handed down to us, can say we have everything that we need. So I don't mean when I'm talking about in this section of Job that God really hasn't said everything that needs to be said. God has said everything that needs to be said. Here's what I mean by God being silent. Even though Job held on to those four great theological truths that we learned in this first mini-series, the picture is here is that Job just can't seem to put it all together. It's as if, God, I am trying to figure this thing out. My heart is filled with all kind of why questions. I, I, I'm just trying to make sense if you are this and the devil is this and this is happening and that is happening. I'm trying to put it together. And it just seems like, God, you're not helping me understand this thing. I just can't wrap my mind around it. I pray and I pray and I read and I read your word and I talk to others around me and it still just doesn't seem to make sense. It's like you are silent. It's like you're out there somewhere and you're not answering me and you're not leading me and you're not speaking to me. And maybe you can identify with a young man named Richard, not a Richard in our church, but a Richard that Philip Yancey tells about in his book, Disappointment with God. He writes of the struggles that really Richard had and each point caused him to ask those questions why and he struggled over and over with where is God. Yancey writes, Richard was converted to Christ while in college. Not long after that, his parents announced they were getting a divorce. Notwithstanding Richard's fervent prayers for the preservation of their marriage, they split. This was his first experience of feeling as though God didn't hear him and God hadn't answered his prayer. It didn't make sense to him. Every decision he made in life was preceded by prayer and Bible study. Why was God not doing something? Everything, he writes, seemed to backfire. A lucrative job offer was withdrawn and given to someone less qualified. His soon, he soon found himself in debt. His fiancée jilted him, and he began to experience a series of physical problems. Finally feeling that he had reached his wit's end, he decided to seek God in an all-night prayer vigil. He fasted and prayed and zealously sought the Lord, but all he heard was <laughs> silence. Nothing after it was over, he said, I staked my life on God and it appears that he has let me down. Three questions plagued this young man, Richard, as the book unfolds. Is God unfair? He's tried to follow God, but people who don't follow God seem to have it better than I do. He struggled secondly with God being silent. Every time he called on God, three crucial times in his life, it's as if heaven was silent and nothing was being said. And the third thing he struggled with is it seemed as if God was hidden. He was no longer real to him. And how is it that I can follow a God that seems so not real to me? Now, I know as I read those stories, we as Christians don't like those kind of stories. We like the kind of stories about a 19th century theologian who in one month lost two of his sons, hit rock bottom and wrote these words. When Jimmy died, the grief was painfully sharp, but the acting of faith, the embracing of consolation, and all the cheering truths which ministered comfort to me were just as vivid. That's the place we like to stop. Someone hits rock bottom, things fall apart in their life, they get up and they are happy and they are smiling. That's the kind of stories we like to hear. Perhaps that's the reason why most people don't really read past Job chapter 2. Because Job chapter 3 and following is a story of a man who is struggling with where is God? Why does it appear in my experience that he's not there, that he is silent? We like to read Notes like Job 1 and 2 where a man in his trouble says, Blessed be the Lord, and he seems everything's okay and nothing's bothering him. Where he says, We'll accept good from God as well as the bad, and everything's okay with him. But when we turn the pages, 
And we enter this next section of Job, we find words that I promise you, you don't want to read in your morning devotional time. Like in Job chapter 3, verse 3, where he says, let the day perish on which I was to be born. I mean, how's that for a happy birthday card? In chapter 3, verse 11, he says, why did I not die at birth? In the last part of Job 3, verse 26, he says, I'm not at ease, nor am I quiet. I am not at rest, but turmoil comes. And you're saying, Kevin, are you kidding me? This is the same guy who said, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives, the Lord takes. He's a great God in chapter 1. Yes, but all along while hanging on to those theological truths, he is filled with despair and question upon question and why upon why because he just can't put it together. It doesn't make sense to him. It's as if God is silent. We are very uncomfortable with those kind of passages of Scripture. We don't like to hear the heroes of our faith like Charles Spurgeon write words like this. I am the subject of depression so fearful that I hope none of you ever get to such extremes of wretchedness as I go to. That wasn't one time. That was many times in his life. We don't like to hear the words of William Cooper, the hymn writer, whom we're most familiar with, his hymn, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood, and writes about this fountain that's drawn from Emmanuel's vein, and sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilt and stain, and how Cooper goes on and talks about when he saw that stream by faith, flowing wounds supplied, that redeeming love became his song all the days of his life. We like that about William Cooper, but we just can't somehow handle the backstory to his real life. That same lover of God in the gospel lived one of the most difficult, depressing, sad lives of any hymn writer you will ever read about. His mother died at six years of old, and when he was 53 years old, he writes a poem reminding himself of that dark day when he saw the hearse take his mom away from him. 53 years later. It gets worse in his life. Not only did his mom die at six years old, his father sent him away to a boarding school after that where he was cruelly bullied and beaten by other kids. After a two-year engagement, his fiancée's father finally decided you can't have her as a wife and he lost the love of his life. Before his conversion, these are all what was going on in his life. You would think that would take run somebody away from God. But all the stress, all the pressures of the life that he had He finally says before his conversion, I was struck with such dejection of spirit and none but they who have felt the same can have the least conception of. Day and night I was upon the rack laying down in horror and rising up in despair. Back a little earlier in his life, you heard about the poem at age 53, but at age 31 he was committed to uh, an asylum which would be a psychiatric hospital. And he was committed to that because he had had a catastrophic psychotic break with reality. It was there in that place that six months later he came to know Christ. But you would think now life would be easy for him. Life would be like a joyful, no trouble, God is good, this is your best life now kind of experience. And yet after that, four more occasions of his life as a Christian, He suffered deep depression. And shortly, when he died around 1800, the last thing he ever penned in his life was, I feel unutterable despair. And during that time, he penned a hymn like this, which we've never sung in this church, and you probably don't want to sing it because it reveals the depth of his sadness and his sorrow. He says, where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is the soul-refreshing view of Jesus and his word? The dearest idol I have known, whatever that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. So shall my walk be close with God, calm and serene my frame, so pure shall shall mark the road that leads me to the Lamb. He just didn't know where the Savior was. He couldn't find him. Christopher Ashe helps us understand what Job is experiencing when he writes these words in his commentary. A true Christian believer may be taken by God through times of deep and dark despair. 
This may happen to a man or woman who is affirmed by God as a believer before the darkness, who remains a believer in the darkness, and who will finally be vindicated by God as a believer after the darkness. He or she may be taken through the darkest, even the darkness, even though he or she has not fallen into sin or backslidden from faith in Jesus Christ. This, he says, is a very important truth. So let's wade into this issue. Let's talk about this for just a moment. Why won't God speak to me? Well, that's what Job is encountering. As I've already alluded to, the reality is that God waits a long time to speak to Job. God doesn't utter a word in the book of Job until chapter 38, verse 1. You read there, then the Lord answered Job. For all of these long chapters, for 36 long chapters, Job is trying to put together why he's going through what he is going through. He's still holding on to those truths, but it doesn't take away the why questions and the struggles that are in his heart. In fact, if you just glance down at chapter 2, verse 13, you will note that the situation in Job's life is about to be revealed as being so difficult that nobody could say a word to him because they saw how great the pain was he was in. So in chapter 3, you're going to discover this same Job of chapter 1 and 2 who absolutely does say, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. We'll receive good from him as well as the bad. You're going to see the same guy, but it doesn't mean that even while holding on to those wonderful and profound theological truths, he doesn't struggle with despair, discouragement, and depression. Once again, before we jump into the passage, listen to what Christopher Ashe says. Job is terribly, frighteningly alone. He sits on the rubbish heap. His wife has come and gone after a disagreement. His only companion, if we can call it such, is a broken shard of pottery with which he scratches himself. At this stage, we can only guess what thoughts filled his mind. Did he think back to days of purpose when he got out of bed with drive and desire to work energetically, to manage his farm and to govern his household? Did he remember the accolades given him for his justice, his care for his employees, and his business success? Were there memories of his sons and daughters in their childhood? All of that is the context that begins us here in this chapter 2 and proceeds all the way for 36 long chapters. He doesn't know where God is. And guess, guess what? By the time you get a hold of what's going on with Job in this section, The greatest sorrow for him now is he's lost his closest friend. It's not the three who come, but the God that he knows is sovereign. The God that he knows is good, that loves him, that is working out his purposes. But he can't find his friend anywhere. He just seems to not be there. So the question I asked myself as I thought through the book of Job some time ago, I've been thinking through this book, studying it for a year or so, What's the reason? Why is God not speaking to Job? Why is he silent? Well, just listen to some very quick bulleted points that come out throughout this section about Job. Maybe he's mad at me. Maybe I have finally just gone too far with something and he is angry and he is mad at me. Maybe, Job might say to us, he has left me to myself. He's abandoned me. He's he's, he's given me everything I need and he's telling me, now you go figure this out. Maybe Job thinks that God has no answer. Maybe he doesn't have an answer to give me. Maybe there is no answer. Maybe he's working on how to answer me. All those things are going through Job's mind in this section. Now listen very carefully. That is why this section is not a section to draw theological conclusions about what you do when you don't get answers. It is to reveal the struggle and the trial in his soul and the questions like your questions and my questions that run through our mind. And God's Word don't, doesn't hide those from us. It doesn't take them away and say, no, a man of God would never think like that. But he did. They went through his heart and they went through his mind. So don't draw any great theological conclusions about the things that Job says as if, well, that's how we're supposed to think. No, they're not. It's not that God is mad. 
It's not that he has left him to himself. It's not that there is no answer. It's not that he's working on trying to figure out an answer. Maybe this is the conclusion that God wants Job to come to. Maybe Job is not ready to hear what God is going to say. Maybe he is not ready to hear what God is going to say. And this long period of silence is somewhat instructive to us that we don't, as sufferers or those that we are trying to minister to and care for in suffering, don't quickly and immediately come to the answer that Job is going to ultimately get when God speaks in chapter 38. And what is it? Well, you already know this. I've told you this before. Job, in the end, never gets an answer to his why questions. What he gets is a lot of attributes. And what that means is Job reaches the point, he comes to the place where he is ready to say, it's okay if I don't know why, as long as I know who. And if I can hang on to a God that big, I'll be okay. And I promise you, I've said this to you, it's not a neat little quote I've come up with. It is the actual reality of life that I've come to and I hope you've come to and I think we can grow deeper in. And it's this. It's never that our problems are too big. It's just that our view of God is too small. Job doesn't get answers. He gets attributes. He gets a picture in the end of who this God is and how big he is. And Job is going to be really happy and content. Most people don't get to that place. They spend their lives perpetually forever circling the drain, as it were, trying to unravel the why question. And that's okay, I want to tell you. That's okay at a point. That's where Job is at as we come to this chapter this morning. He's at a place to where he is revealing the turmoil, the confusion, the struggle in his soul. And my question for you, brothers and sisters, is how are we going to minister to those people? How do you minister to your own soul in those times? How do others who come around you minister to you? How do you offer the things that need to be said and done when others come around you? Well, let's look at this passage and let's notice, first of all, Job's comforters, what I call his true friends. In chapter 2, verse 11, we read, now, when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that, he had, that had come upon him, they came each one from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Nahamite, and they made an appointment together to come to sympathize with him and comfort him. Now, let's pause right there for just a moment. I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, because we often give Job's friends a bad rap, and they will get wrapped when they move from being comforters to counselors because they often offer a counsel that's really one-sided and never balanced. And we'll look at that later on as we come to chapter 4 and look at these conversations between Job and his friends. But right now, what I want you to see is the true nature of their friendship. They're right. They really are his friends. Job has three friends and it's a reminder to us as we think about this this morning that really friendship is something very unique. What is a friend? What do we mean when we talk about a friend? We talk about friends on Facebook, right? And, and I just was so curious. I had to figure out what was the average number of Facebook friends that you guys have. Not you particularly, but you, you do Facebook. Average is 338 friends, so-called. That's average. I know some of you got way more than that, but don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. You won't get cut off from Facebook until you reach the limit of 5,000, okay? But we use that term in a way that really is nowhere close to what Job's friends are. Nowhere close to it. In fact, I think the best verse for us to remember here is what Proverbs 18.24 says. A man of many companions, you should note that's plural, I would call them Facebook friends. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend, notice this, singular, who sticks closer than a brother. And we often say, well, that's Jesus. Well, yes, it is, but he's talking about a real human being here. We have many companions. We have a lot of people in our world around us, but there is a friend. When you find this friend, will stick closer than a brother. 
friends, goes much deeper in this Hebrew passage of Job than what we are accustomed to using it. The word friends, really in this passage, is defined by words like unbreakable relationships. You don't defriend, right? Or unfriend or whatever you all do when you don't want to look at somebody else's stuff, right? That's not what a, a, this friend does. It's unbreakable. It doesn't come to an end. It's built around covenant love and loyalty. In fact, the passage I just cited for you there under it in 2 Samuel 16, verses 16 and 17 is an interesting passage. It shows you how that one of David's former friends or former associates, companions, considered something to be out of the norm if this person was a friend. Hushai, the archite, David's friend, pretended to have, a, have gone over from David's side to support the counsel of his rebel son Absalom. You may remember that although Absalom is glad to, to have Hushai's counsel, he's surprised and he says to him, is this your loyalty, your steadfast loyalty to your friend? Why did you not go with your friend? Didn't make any sense to him that he would come over there and hang out with him because that's what a friend doesn't do. He really is unbreakable, loyal in his love. And isn't it amazing that we read in this verse that Job has three friends? Three friends? It's been said if in your life you have two friends, you will be above average. I mean real true friends if you have two. The reality is normally most people only have one true friend in their life. And Job has three. And the longer you live, the older you are, the more you realize who are friends and who are friends. That's the nature of just kind of defining who friends are. And so these are friends of Job. Now, who are they? Let's think about their relationship with Job. I'm just going to quickly remind you of this because there are three of them. The first one is called Eliphaz. His name means God is fine gold. He's from Temanite. So he's a Temite. And what that really means here, probably based on the passages in Job 15.10 and Job 42.7, that he's probably the oldest of the three. In Job 15, it describes him as a gray-haired man and actually that he is older than Job's father. Chapter 42, verse 7, when God addresses those three guys, his friends, it is Eliphaz who is addressed as if he is the main leader and the spokesman. And the fact that he comes from Timon is a reminder that it's a place that's known for a lot of wisdom. So he's supposed to be the oldest guy, the smartest guy in the group. The next guy that's mentioned there is Bildad the Shuhite. We're just going to call him the unknown one because there is nowhere else in the Bible that his name is ever mentioned again. We don't know anything about him, so I would just be guessing and assuming who he was. He obviously is a friend with Eliphaz because Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar are going to get together and plan a trip to go see their friend. But we don't know anything about him. The last guy that's in the list of these three at this point is a man named Zophar, and his name means young bird. That means he's probably the youngest. And again, not much about him, but we have an older, supposed wiser man a younger in the group of three, and then one in the middle that we know little about. But what we do know about them is they are his friends. Because what unfolds here is that they have contacted each other. They have worked out a plan. They've taken their resources, whatever it took, to make sure that together they came to visit the friend called Job. They've heard of his suffering. So what do they see? What do they see here? Let me read on. And they made an appointment, at verse 11, and they came together to come to sympathize with him and comfort him. Now, as you look at those verses, and as he reads on, we read on down to verse 13, there's something that this is reminding us here about. Somebody ultimately had to point out Job to them. You read verse 12, and when they lifted up their eyes at a distance and did not recognize him, they raised their voices and wept. So obviously, Job here is beyond recognition in his suffering. It's as if these three friends are saying, are you sure that's our friend? Because the last time we saw him, he didn't look anything like that at all. Give you an idea of how difficult it is. And yet it says what they have come to do, now that they know it is Job, in verse 11, is to sympathize with him and to comfort him. What does that mean? 
Well, sympathizing or consoling is more than just a quick hug. Job, we're sorry that you're having a rough time, man. We're praying for you. It's bigger than that. It literally is the idea of shaking the head, rocking your body back and forth as a sign of grief and despair. It's as if when we encounter suffering and we see, hear it or we see it, it's as if we put our hand over our mouth and we gasp when we go, oh my gosh. That's what is happening. That's what they're feeling and they are sympathizing with him. But they didn't just feel shaken when they saw him. It says they came to comfort him, which meant they came to share in his pain. They came to give him a hand in his suffering that's what the word comfort is. It's actually a wonderful picture used in Isaiah 66, 13, where a mother is tending to the helpless needs of her baby. So they didn't just come to give him a hug and leave. They came to sympathize with him, but to say, how can we as his friends really comfort him? How can we do that? And let me remind you, as the verses go on to tell us, they're going to be with him seven days and seven nights. And they're not staying at the Hilton. They are not staying at a bed and breakfast inn. They are staying at a garbage dump. I don't know how many of you, probably most of you, have been to a landfill in a garbage dump, right? I usually get out of there within seven minutes. I can't envision hanging out at the landfill for seven 24-hour days. And not just hanging out there, but making a bed with Job in the trash dump and hanging out with him for seven days and seven nights. It's not like you go and you get cleaned up and you come back and you go, okay, here's that stink again. No, you stay with him. Seven days and seven nights. And notice what they did in the remaining verses there. First, They wailed in grief. Notice it says in verse 12, they raised their voices and wept. They wept. Secondly, in verse 12, and each of them tore his robe. They tore their robe. These friends tear their robes in the custom of the day from the neck towards the heart as if to say, Job, just what ripped your heart apart with the loss of not only your possessions but your children and everything you have is gone even though you know all these great truths and theology that you're holding on to and they are your anchor, the why questions are still there and it just rips your heart and it rips our heart. Thirdly, it says, and they threw dust over their heads towards the sky. He had been unable to bathe, Job had, and had grown filthy so they would join him in dirtying their hair and their clothes. In other words, they're getting their hands dirty. They're getting into the mess. They're just saying, we're going to be right with you with what you're going through. The fourth thing, verse 13, then they sat down on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. Why is that significant? You can't get any closer to the earth than sitting on it. They didn't pull up a chair and sat. They sat on the earth. As if to say, Job, we came from dirt. We're returning to dirt. It's as if your life is almost over. We're going to get as low as we can to the dust and mourn with you. And then the last thing they did, the very last thing they did in verse 13, this is the way the chapter ends. Then they sat down on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights with no one speaking a word to him, for they saw that his pain was very great. The last thing they did is they didn't say a word. They didn't say a word. At this point, these friends have come to sympathize, to comfort, to get in the mess that he is in and the struggles of his soul and they're just going to sit with him. Just going to be with him. Now I'm going to come back at the end of the sermon and this won't take me long to do this. But in chapter 3, I want to move from Job's comforter to Job's confusion. Because when you see the confusion in his soul, you will begin to understand the application of what his friends did in a profound way. It doesn't quite mean as what, as what's going on as well until you really grasp the confusing and the tormenting frustrations that are going on in Job's soul. 
Now, let me just remind you of something I said at the beginning of the book of Job. It's important that you understand this and know why we can move pretty fast through these verses. In chapters 1 and 2, the book of Job is written in what's called prose, P-R-O-S-E. It's a story. It's a narrative. That's how we read chapters 1 and 2. It's as if you're just reading the story, the news of what's going on in Job's life, even including his friends coming and what they did. But when you come to chapter 3 and you go all the way to chapter 41 of the book of Job, it's what's called poetry. It's not poetry like you and I know, roses are red, violets are blue. It's not that kind of poetry. It's Hebrew poetry that paints imagery and pictures so that you feel the emotion of what is going on. And so as I walk you quickly through this section of Job's confusion, notice that it's very poetic. It's not rhyming poetry. It's picturesque. It's descriptive. It has pictures that paint struggles of the soul so that you get the idea of just what Job's friends really were doing when they came. Look with me at chapter 3. There are three basic things that Job wishes for in this poetic imagery of chapter 3. Let me read for you verses 1 through 10 as we see, first of all, Job wishes he had never been born. Afterward, Job opened his mouth. By the way, the first time Job speaks in this way, but it sounds different than when he opened his mouth in chapters 1 and 2. He opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Now notice very carefully, in chapters 1 it said, In all this Job did not sin nor curse God. He has not sinned and he has not cursed God, but he has actually cursed the, his day of birth. He just wished he had never been born. He comes close to cursing God, but he's not cursing God. He's actually just wishing he would have never come into existence. Notice how he paints this picture. And Job said, Let the day perish on which I was to be born. And the night which said, A boy is conceived. Now just picture this. Job is thinking of his mom and dad and their intimacy and their loving to, of each other. And that night they realized, We're going to have a baby. And then the day came obviously nine months later, and he is born, and Job is saying, I wish that day never happened. I wish that night had never happened. I mean, after all, God, you knew that this day of suffering would come for me. Why would you ever let me be conceived and born? Notice the imagery here. It's just so, so moving. Verse 4, may the day be darkness. Let not God above care for it, nor light shine on it. Let darkness and black gloom claim it. Let the cloud settle on it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, let darkness seize it. Let, not re- let, let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Behold, let the night be barren. Let no joyful shout enter it. Let those curse it who curse the day, who are prepared to rouse Leviathan. Just by the way, little Leviathan is a, uh, is a, a, a mythological sea creature who they believed had some power to disrupt and, 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 and control things. And he's saying, even let those, those gods out there end this day. Make it never happen. Verse 9, let the stars of its twilight be darkened. Let it wait for light but have none and let it not lose the breaking dawn because it did not shut open opening of my mother's womb or hide trouble from my eyes. You get the picture here? I just wish I'd have never been born. Is this a man of God? Is this a righteous and upright man God has told us he is? But his soul is deeply troubled and he is struggling. Number two. The second thing in verses 11 to 19, the next section is Job wishes had he been born He had not lived. Look at what he says in verse 11. Why did I not die at birth? Come forth from the womb and expire. Why did the knees receive me? And why the breast that I should suck? For now I would have lain down and been quiet. I would have slept. Then I would have been at rest. Notice those four things are kind of what happens when you go to bed at night, right? It's the picture here. You lay down. You get quiet. You sleep. And you rest. 
And Job is saying, I just wish that day would have happened for me, that I would have never gotten back up. Verse 14. I would have slept with kings and with counselors of the earth who rebuilt ruins for themselves or with the princesses who had gold who were filling their houses with silver. And what he's basically saying is it doesn't matter if you have a lot of money, you all end up dying. Money won't keep you alive. All you have in this world won't keep you from death. Verse 16, or like a miscarriage which is discarded, I would not be as infants that never saw light. There the wicked cease from raging and there the weary are at rest. The prisoners are at ease together. They do not hear the voice of the taskmaster. The small and the great are there and the slave is free from his master. What's he saying in all those imageries? He's just saying when you die, your troubles kind of go away. (laughs) So God, I mean, you knew you were sovereign. You let me be born. I don't get it. If you knew I was going to go through this, why? That's my struggle. And if you knew even after I was born, that day would come Why did you let me keep living? Why didn't you just let me die? The last thing in this poetic imagery he points out is that Job wishes now that he would just die. He wishes he would just die. I didn't even want to live. I just want to die. Verse 20. Why is light given to him who suffers and life to the bitter of soul who long for death but there is none and dig for it more than for hidden treasures? Isn't that an amazing imagery? more than all the riches and the wealth I could get in this world. I'm just digging, trying to find how can I die? How? Verse 22. Who rejoice greatly and exult when they find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden and whom God has hedged in? For my groaning comes at the sight of my food, and my cries pour out like water. For what I fear comes upon me. Isn't that an interesting thing? Job's thinking and reminding himself, I was thinking one day, you know, life could get really hard for people. What I fear, he says, has come upon me. And what I dreaded befalls me. I'm not at ease. I'm not quiet. And I'm not at rest. I don't get to go to sleep and life's over, is what he is saying. But turmoil comes. Turmoil comes. That is the soul filled with why questions. And maybe in your life of suffering, you've encountered those kind of questions. Maybe in the life of your friends, your brothers and sisters that you have been around have encountered those kind of questions. And my question for us is, how do you act like Job's friends at this point? How do you do what Job did? Let me wrap it up and give you three practical things I think a real friend will do in the times of their friends going through troubles and suffering. Number one, a true friend recognizes that simply quoting a scripture or a list of them will not eliminate suffering. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I am a man who believes that everything we need for life and godliness is found in this book. And it is the place we turn to. It is what we lean on. It's what we trust in. It's what we govern our lives by. But what I am trying to get you to understand that there is a point to where it's not appropriate to a sufferer to walk in and say, you're not going to believe it. I was just reading this verse this morning And it's just for you. If you'll just believe this, look how God really is talking to you through this. Now, is there a place we're going to see that happen in the book of Job where truth and who God is comes? Yes. But it's not always the first line of action to the sufferer that we need to do. I remember how Proverbs 25.11 says, like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken in timely circumstances. You just don't come in blurting out the verse of the day for them necessarily. And that's what I mean by that. You and I are not going to relieve their suffering just because you come blazing in there with all these verses. Proverbs 15, 23 says, A man has joy in an appropriate answer, and how delightful is a well-timed word. So there's wisdom when that happens. 
and just coming in as a true friend and saying, hey, I found this verse for you. In fact, I found you a coffee mug with a verse. This is going to make things better for you. May not be the first thing to do. Number two, a true friend refrains from the temptation to try and say something profound. That's what I do. I've done so many times in my life, particularly when I was younger. I'm just going to come together with this great, all pieces put together kind of way of thinking, say something profound, and they're going to go, oh, thank you, Pastor. That was amazing. But that is not how it often goes. I have discovered that in those initial moments with the sufferer, I do not need to summarize all of who God is in a couple of sentences. The truth of the matter is, Romans 11.33 says of our God, how unsearchable are God's judgments and unfathomable His ways. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that He will instruct him? There are things He just knows that I just can't put together. And Proverbs 25.2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. Isn't that an amazing statement of Scripture? God gets the glory when He conceals things. We're running around trying to explain to everybody, to everybody why this is going on and what is happening so God will get the glory and God is saying, no, I'm going to conceal some things so I'll get the glory. Total different way of thinking. So a true friend refrains sometimes from trying to come up with profound statements that make everything simple. Lastly, a true friend realizes that you don't always have to speak to express genuine love and care. That's hard. That's hard to not open your mouth and say something. I'm speaking as one who knows that. That is very hard. But I came across at once what happened with the story of Jesus and Lazarus in John 11. And in that passage, if you remember, four days later, Jesus finally shows up and Lazarus is dead. And when he comes up, this is the first thing that happens. When he comes up, verse 35, the shortest verse in the Bible says, you know what it says? Jesus wept. He didn't give a sermon on his love. He didn't give a sermon on his sovereignty. He didn't give a sermon at all at that point. The very first thing you read there is Jesus wept. And the amazing statement it follows in verse 36 is what the Jews said. See how he loved him. He didn't say a word, Jesus. You were just there. Again, I'm not undermining us saying words and opening the word and rightly helping them understand and work through those struggles of our scriptures. I'm not telling you that. But I'm saying we're too quick to use that as the first way. There is a time when a true friend needs to realize that just pounding them with scriptures, loading them up with scriptures, is not going to make the questions go away right then. A true friend needs to know that they're not there to say something profound. The third thing and the last thing is the true friend needs to realize that you don't always have to speak to express genuine love and care. And one of the commentaries that I've used in this study of Job, one of the commentators quotes from Joseph Bailey's book, The Last Thing We Talk About. He tells the story of Joe and his wife, Mary Lou, who lost three of their children. They lost one son following surgery when he was only 18 days old. The second son died at age five from leukemia. They lost a third son at age 18 after a sledding accident. And here's what he writes when... The last, thing, the last things we talk about, he writes, I was sitting torn by grief. This is the, the, the parents. I was sitting torn by grief. Someone came and talked to me of God's dealings, of why it happened, of hope beyond the grave. He talked constantly. He said things I already knew were true and believed. I was unmoved, except I wished he'd go away. He finally did. Another came and sat beside me for an hour. He listened when I said something. 
answered briefly, prayed simply, and left. I was moved. I was comforted. I hated to see him go. That's a friend. Let's pray.